Hi there, and welcome to episode six of the Gym Owner's Guide to the Galaxy. This podcast is a production of Sweat Angels. Sweat Angels helps gym owners generate friend-to-friend referrals on Facebook. Every month, thousands of affiliate gyms, group fitness clubs, yoga studios, and martial arts schools rely on Sweat Angels to help them grow. To learn more about Sweat Angels, head to causely.com forward slash sweat angels. That's causely.com forward slash sweat angels, or just search for us on Facebook. Thanks for listening today. I'm John Ruji. And I'm Matt Sharp. Today we'll be talking to Baker Levitt, an early member of the Kill Cliff team. In a very short time, Kill Cliff has built one of the strongest brands in the fitness nutrition space. And today we'll hear from Baker on how to build and foster your own brand. Yeah, so me and Baker met probably four or five years ago, I think at Brick CrossFit. And I think you were out there maybe doing some sort of promotion and uh, have been, you know, uh, internet friends since then. We see each other usually once a year at the CrossFit Games or, or if there's some sort of event like that. And uh, have always really respected Kill Cliff and the brand and, and really how you guys have built that into pretty much a monster brand now. And uh, I remember my first, I saw my first can of Kill Cliff. A guy slipped it to me at CrossFit like it was some sort of underground beverage. And uh, it wasn't even cold. And uh, he's like, you got to check these guys out. And uh, I remember drinking it and thinking, oh, this, these, those guys are onto something. I'm knowing that it's tough to get into the beverage industry. So, um, no, it's, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that when we started the podcast, you know, we talked about who, who are the type of people we'd want to talk to, and, and Baker came up really quickly. So uh, it's an honor to have you on the podcast. And um, just, just to kind of get us started, could you give us a little bit of your background and, and really kind of the origins of Kill Cliff and uh, just, just to give some people the context? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I love talking about uh, Kill Cliff and how we got started. And hopefully, whatever we talk about today, something, someone somewhere can walk away with, you know, a little nugget of information that'll help their business. But yeah, I um, so I have two food also, and I was at the Southeast Regional in Jacksonville, Florida, in 2011. I was living in New York City at the time, and um, I crossed paths with Todd Ehrlich. Todd was the SEAL, former SEAL that started and founded Kill Cliff in January of 2011. And we crossed paths at a fundraiser and we just kind of hit it off. And I was like, oh, you know, this is a great product. I like it. Um, and I just kind of started working for Kill Cliff. Like I was never officially hired. I just kind of started working. And if you look at the early days of Kill Cliff, and the, co- the, 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 group, the core group of people that started that company, none of us were ever hired. It was kind of like Lord of the Rings. Like we all just showed up and just got to work. Like the first person that I officially like hired was Josh Haskins. Um, and j- same thing with Josh. He just kind of showed up to work. Josh was living in Jacksonville at the time. And, um, was in the process of moving to Tampa and he just kind of showed up and started working for Kill Cliff. And so, um, that's, you know, Todd started a company in January, 2011, and it was basically kind of, he's a serial entrepreneur and he's got that mindset of like, all right, let's just jump off this cliff and we'll figure out how to work this parachute on the way down. It's going to be fine. You know? And I think, a, lot, a reason for that is, you know, Todd was a former SEAL and, you know, those guys are trained that you can accomplish anything, you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, and that's just kind of how the company started and how we got going. And um, it's been a wild ride. I mean, it, we just we were just uh, ranked in the Inc. 5000 as the number one fastest growing privately held beverage company in the U.S. And just to see... To see where we are now versus where we were four years ago, like sitting in Todd's kitchen and just having a late night conversation, drinking some Jack Daniels, it's just amazing. Like, you know, I wake up and I pinch myself. I'm like, is this real? Is this like kind of a joke or like, when am I going to wake up from this? But it's been wonderful. It's been amazing. So when you joined, were you brought on to do something specific or was it just a team of guys? No, just I'm here. You figured it out along the way. Yeah, we just kind of, you know, know, just the law of common sense. That's how we run the company. Everything is based on the law of common sense. And if you stick to that premise and don't do things 
that don't make sense and don't ever, don't ever do anything if the reason you're given to do that is, oh, well, this is just how it's done. That's the dumbest thing in the world. What that means is I have no clue how to explain what's going on or why you should do it, but just do it, you know, because you know, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, because you guys do a lot of things differently, right? Especially early oh, on. Oh, everything. I mean, because mm-hmm. it's, it's so hard to break into the beverage industry. And you guys, I remember, you guys just started showing up. Yeah, you just get out. Johnny Appleseed, just run around sowing your seeds. You know, beat the streets, beat the bushes. If you want to accomplish something and you want to do something, just just do it. Like it's like that Shia LaBeouf video, you know, where he's flipping out saying <laughs> just do it. Like he sounds completely insane. There's a lot of truth to that, though. It's all true. Yeah. It's like you know, it, it, you know, people. Um, I'm a huge Gary Vee fan. You know, like I, uh, I, yeah. I think that guy's awesome, and the stuff he says, and it's 100 percent true, and it's like. A lot of people value sleep more than they do success, you know, and, that, and that's a downfall. Like there's, you know, nine to six, nine to five, you know, that, that lifestyle, you're never going to accomplish anything that way, ever. Um, you can have a, you know, a secure job working nine to five and a retirement and a pension and all that stuff. But like, that's just, that's not the life that I choose to lead. And I don't, I'm not, I'm never going to be that way. Like I want to accomplish and I want to do cool things. And I want to make a lot of cool friends along the way. And I, you know, I want to, when it's all said and done, I want someone to say Baker did it his way and he did some really cool stuff, you know? Yeah. And I think one of the really neat things about the Killcliffe brand is that a lot of the personality traits that you just described are reflected in the brand. If you look at the content you're producing on you know, Facebook or Instagram or wherever, a lot of it reflects that can do attitude. You're celebrating people who've done awesome things whether it's in the fitness community or, or outside of it, can you talk a little bit about how that brand developed, how that, what elements yeah. of your personality are reflected in? That's one of my favorite things about Kilcliffe. So, um, Stacy Kaysen runs all our social media now and she does a great job. Uh, I focus now on business development and, um, you know, covering the Northwest territory. I'm also, I'm so heavily involved. I shoot a lot of content over to her and kind of give guidance and whatnot, but she's done a great job. When I started with Kilcliffe and I started on our Facebook page, we had like 1,200 or 1,700 Facebook followers, like 200 Twitter followers, and Instagram didn't exist, I don't think. And um, we've grown those platforms tremendously, and I was in real estate for many years, and I made a killing doing it. And then just as quickly as I made a killing, I lost everything I had, you know? And, you know, um, the goal, so I have a really bad taste about now about being driven by money and profit and like I, I like doing deals and, and, and being successful and all that stuff but like I don't ever wake up and say I gotta make money today or I wanna make money or uh, that's not that doesn't go into my head like the whole thing behind our social media was like if I can make someone laugh or I can make someone smile or feel special or engage someone then that, that, that's what I want to do. That's how I want to do this. Like, I want to make people laugh. I don't want to try to sell them anything. I don't want to push stuff down their throat. And, you know, and I want to promote other companies that are engaging with us, and I want to engage people. That's what I want to do. And so that was always the goal, and it worked out tremendously. Was that something you were able to do right from the start, or is that something you had to learn day one. how to do well? That's all we had. That's all we had day one was – you know, I got in my car and I would drive to gyms and drop in and visit them and give them kill clip and stuff. But like our social media, that was everything. That's all we had. That was, our, that was our only way to communicate. So, you know, back then it was easy to engage. Every person that commented on our social media, we, we engaged and we responded. We liked their posts and stuff um, and just created, a, you know, a, a fan base that way, you know. And the, the same original people that were a part of it then are, are still a part of it now, you know, like our you know, the, the fans of the brand. Yeah, I would say, especially early on when I was seeing what you guys were doing on social media, it wasn't necessarily you guys were, you guys were even trying to sell Kill Cliff. You were just trying to be, f- like, have fun. And yeah, most of our posts were, were not about Kill Cliff. We didn't have any content back then, you know. And so we would just share posts, and people would tag us in pics and stuff, and, you know, that was just kind of how we did it and what we did. Yeah, you and did you guys... Who who was how did you guys shape like the social media stuff early on? Did you guys discuss that stuff or was it like, hey, we have a Facebook no. account, let's just have fun with I it? I just did it. 
I just did it. I just jumped on there and went to work. Because you guys posted a lot early on, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, well, considering the, the how many people you with, had. Yeah, this algorithm with Facebook has totally changed. I mean, that's totally different now. And Facebook's not the same animal that it once was. Um, and that's one of the things that CrossFit gym owners um, and just businesses in general need to understand is how the different platforms work and what they're designed for. Can you so, talk about, yeah, go ahead. Twitter is a Twitter is a is a micro blogging platform. All right, and it's great to directly engage with businesses, people, and individuals. You can you can you can send a message directly to someone. Instagram, which is purchased by Facebook several years ago, that is a place to post really cool pictures, engaging photos. Okay. Twitter and Instagram, the conversation does not take place there. It was never – they've never really figured out how, the convert, how, to, how to master the whole conversation thing. Facebook is the, is the platform where the conversation takes place. That is where you can actually communicate, have conversation, dialogue, and debate on that platform. And you guys recently expanded to Pinterest as well, right? Mm-hmm. How do you I know use... nothing about Pinterest. Okay. I, I don't know anything about it. Well, face, Facebook's kind of been our bread and butter since we started, and you know that's where yeah. that's where well, we really started following you guys as well because all those platforms matter, but none of them has mattered as much to us as Facebook, just right. Because of the conversation. So, like if I was a gym owner, like you, you use Twitter, you use Instagram to build your gym community, okay. Those of you, you guys obviously played sports growing up. Remember when you'd get your name in the newspaper for like a big play or something? Oh, it was big time. I think Matt got his in the world. name in the newspaper more than I did, just to <laughs> guess. It, well, you so cut that, it, yeah, that was a big deal. You can build your community as a gym owner on Instagram by promoting and bragging about your members. If you're a gym owner, every single class should get a picture posted on Instagram. And you tag your members in that photo. And that's their day. That's their that's their thing. They're in the newspaper now. All right. That's true. Facebook. If I was a gym owner, I, and Sweat Angels is really good at this. I would insist that every single one of my gym members, when they walked in to um, the, the gym, they checked in on Facebook because that is the, the greatest form of marketing that a gym owner has. Their members check in. It get, the, the member, so Bobby walks into CrossFit XYZ, checks in. All of Bobby's friends now know that Bobby is at CrossFit XYZ. And eventually, they're going to say, what the hell is this CrossFit XYZ stuff? i got to check it out. So it's a recruiting tool. It's also a tool to inform your members about what's going on in the community, what you, upcoming seminars, things of that nature, throwdowns, or whatever. Yeah. And then um, raw files – get promoted on Facebook because Facebook does not want you leaving Facebook to go to YouTube. So YouTube links get killed on Facebook. So yeah. also if I was a gym owner, what I would do is I would take footage with my camera, my iPhone and put the raw file, upload it directly to the gym Facebook page. Yeah. We've, we've learned that when, when, when Facebook started pushing down YouTube, that was one of the first things we did was we start doing the video straight to Facebook. And you know, a lot of times, We'll we'll push uh, resources to our owners that, that that we work with, and one of one of the things that we we talk about is is actually having or putting those videos on Facebook directly because a lot of people still yeah. still don't know that they still want to upload and, and post the YouTube video to Facebook, not knowing that Facebook is pushing it down. Right, and most gym owners don't under don't, most people don't know how to upload a video from their phone in HD. Yep, yep, yep. That drives me nuts. So you go into your phone settings and you adjust your phone to where it uploads in HD. Really, really simple. You know, one of the other things I see a lot too, it's kind of the lazy man's guide to Instagram and Facebook is you take a photo on Instagram or a video on Instagram and repost it to Facebook. Sometimes it's a great thing to do, but done too much, that's not the right strategy. Do you have any thoughts on that? Say that one more time. Posting content on Instagram directly and then sharing it to Facebook versus trying to share different content on each channel? Um, for gym owners, that's not, I don't really have a problem with that um, because some of their members aren't on Instagram. Like your older members don't tend to be on the Instagram platform. So that's totally fine. What I hate seeing is content uploaded to Instagram and then shared to YouTube. Mm. 
I mean, I'm sorry, shared to, uh, shared to Twitter. To Twitter. Oh, okay. right. Yeah, because Twitter and Facebook don't get along, and they don't want um, you leaving the platform, so they, they, they make it a little difficult. And then you're switching platforms. And really, all, all of those platforms really are trying to stand alone, I guess, outside of Instagram and being bought by Facebook. But they really all right. they really all have their own kind of conversations, and they really it doesn't it doesn't bode well usually when you're yeah, they're all designed something. for different things. Like yeah, like Facebook wants the photos going to Instagram, but you know, as a gym owner, if you're you know tagging your members and you're uploading to Instagram and then kicking it over to Facebook, as long as you're tagging your members, that's totally fine. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with that. But the Twitter thing that's that's a little different. You have any thoughts on how a gym owner should or should not use Facebook? Because there's kind of a penalty if you don't do it well. It's almost better not to have an account at all, right? Mm, to a degree, yeah. But what a gym owner should—the only thing a gym owner should care about is the members in their gym. That's it. They don't need—they don't need to concern themselves with how many followers they have or any of that stuff or what other gyms are doing. That's not important. Like as a gym owner, the only thing that matters to you in your world is your community that lives with and breathes within the walls of your affiliate. That's all you should care about. So if you're doing right by your members and you're engaging your members and you're promoting your members, that's how you build community. Because, you know, let's say Sue comes in and does a workout on Monday morning and then goes to work and all of a sudden she gets a notification that she was tagged by CrossFit XYZ in a post on social media. It's going to make her feel better, you know, and she's going to feel like she's a part of the, uh, like she's going to feel like she's a part of the, of the gym and the community. Yeah, I, focus on your members. Don't focus on your athletes, and don't focus on yourself. Yeah, that, that's that's <laughs> that's verbatim. What when, when we talk to, I talked to a lot of owners, obviously through this, and that's that's really what I'll have them focus on, and that's why, like for us, especially the check in has been so powerful for us because it highlights that members' relationship to our community, and it just it, it's it's them bragging about us versus us bragging about us. And, right. You know, there. If anybody on the out, anybody that's in the community will like it because they're part of that community, and then people on the outside are curious because they're friends with that person of, of how to get into that community. So that's why Absolutely. that's that's really been kind of the holy grail for us for sure. And it's been instead of folks because we have a lot. I mean, at Maximus, we have a lot of likes, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, to me, like the the check ins and the reviews. And comments, those things mean something to us because that's real engagement. And um, the likes, like who cares, right? For us, you know, because if somebody likes us and they're in another country, I mean, it's cool, but they're not exactly like a potential customer for us. So, Right, yeah, and a lot of people get hung up on that. That should not be um, – that, that should be of no importance. It doesn't mean – because you can't, you can't deposit likes in a bank account. Yeah, and likes don't recruit new members and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Well, there and I, and I do think there's a there's a place for them. Like if you're a national brand, you know it's it's great. But especially if you're a local gym owner, and you have ten thousand likes and eighty clients, it's it's not exactly like that's working for you. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's just yeah, they, they, they need to be authentic likes and authentic followers and fans of your brand. You know, yeah. that's what's important. Like fake buying likes and fake likes and all that stuff. That's completely absurd. Well, one of the things, could you, so we, we talked about a little bit in the beginning about kind of the Kill Cliff persona, um, and, and especially the Facebook page when you guys started out. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that, st- you know, I know you said you guys were just having fun. So how did that kind of evolve into what it is today? Because you guys do have a massive following now, and it's it's going to be more than just some guy like having fun on Facebook. Like it's it, there has to be some system or some way that you guys have, stuck to keeping that kill cliff personality consistent, you know, as you guys grow and not turning into, you know, Coca-Cola. Yeah, so we, it's still like, like humor and entertainment based, but then we also had to start adding some components to it, to the platforms, um, with like informing our consumers about what all is going on in the company where, you know, new locations, new retail vendors and whatnot that are carrying kill cliff where they can get it, you know, um, because not all of our, you know, fan base is, uh, and customer base is, is CrossFit. It's a huge component to it, but there's a lot of people out there, you know, that have never been into a CrossFit gym that can buy Kilcliff at gas stations or grocery stores or Walmart or Sam's and things like that. So, and one of the things, so you guys have definitely expanded. Can you talk about, you know, those first f- few locations you were in and then 
there's probably a couple of maybe handshakes or things that have happened. And usually as a company, we talk about them. They're like a multiplier event. So like when you meet somebody, so do you have things that have happened maybe over the years or in those first few years? Oh, just, go, just getting into things. GNC. Yeah. Getting into GNC was a really big deal for us. Um, we went into GNC when we were a year and a half old. We were the first RTD, which stands for ready to drink. We we're the first RTD to get chain wide uh, clearance, which means we're cleared in every GNC store in the country. And we were the fastest product to go from D stores into all stores ever in the history of GNC. What's it? And then what, D store? Yeah, so GNC ranks their stores A, B, C, D, and then you have yeah, okay. uh, franchise stores. Okay. So that was a huge deal for us because that um, added a, a degree of um, uh, importance to our brand when we met with other distributors. Oh, you guys are in GNC. Yeah. Which was a big deal. And then from there, we went into, you know, Vitamin Shop and Europa. And, you know, they just, it was kind of, that was kind of the big milestone, in my opinion, um, in the company that got us to where we are today was getting in, you know, those big, huge recognized retailers. How did you get in? How did you guys get into GNC? And you don't have to go in crazy detail, but, you know, what? CrossFit. Yeah. They were a sponsor of the games in 2012. And, you know, they approached me about kind of helping them out and how to do stuff and, you know, the, how we did things and what the way we did them. And I just, I was very nice and, and shared a lot of information with them and helped them out tremendously. Um, told them the do's and don'ts, you know, CrossFit and, and all of that. And it just kind of worked out well. And so they looked at us as someone that was trying to help them and wanted them to be successful as opposed to some people that like wouldn't give them the time of day. Yeah. Yep. So those top down events are pretty cool, but you've also seen a lot of kind of grassroots bottom up growth. Every time I go on, uh, Twitter and I look at your page, you're on Instagram. I'm seeing people, they don't work for you, but they're, they've are they got their Kill Cliff shirt on or they've got a selfie of themselves drinking Kill Cliff. Is that something that you guys had to foster or did that come up naturally? And how, how has that evolved over time? It, it, it's all a, a direct result of engagement. Like I think people see our brand and they see that like we're not hard selling or making outlandish claims or any of that stuff. Like we don't make any claims, you know? Um, and I, I just think it's a genuine you know, understanding of what people want and how they want to be treated, you know, and not sold a bunch of bullshit or a bill of goods, which is something that we pride ourselves in. You know, our only claim is, you know, test positive for awesome. And if you don't test positive for awesome, that's genetics. Take it up with your parents. That's not like, that's not my fault. You know what I mean? And uh, I think people just, you know, a lot of it ties back, like I said, to the engagement with our customer base. Uh, it makes people feel good when you engage with them and you pay attention to them. If someone takes time out of their day to buy your product or buy a shirt with your brand on it and wear it and take a picture uh, and post it on social media, that's great. They're not getting paid to do it, you know, and the least thing you can do is is, is kind of thank them for it, you know, by engaging or liking their posts and stuff like that, you know. Right. So on the apparel, is that something that, you know, you saw people talking about Kill Cliff and you thought, hey, I bet they like apparel. There's a real demand for this. Or what, what led to that decision to, to start that product line? So we had our we had our main, you know, we had a handful of shirts. And then uh, last about a year ago, we decided to branch out with our apparel. And that's just something I've been pushing for a while because of Tupu, my apparel company. And just, you know, looking at, you know, that's what CrossFitters have to separate themselves. You know, how do you, how can you tell when you see a CrossFitter out in public? Because they're wearing one of the brand shirts of of the community or they're wearing nanos, you know, and people see that and it just, it's their way to identify themselves and kind of stand apart. And, you know, it's like a red badge of courage, like, you know, wearing a rogue shirt or progenic shirt or kill clip shirt. Yeah. Or, you know, their shirt or their affiliate or whatever. And if you think about it, like there's not a lot of, beverage brands that have an apparel line or, or Correct. a very lame apparel line, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's Absolutely. really cool that you guys, you know, took from that and that learning from, and it's basically just building community. It's, it's a, it's kind of a CrossFit thing, but Harley's been doing it for years and, you know, every community has their apparel and, you know, to, to see a, to be, a beverage company really capitalize on that is pretty cool. And, and you guys have cool Harley- stuff. I wonder if Harley does more in motorcycle sales or licensing fees for their for the Harley brand. 
I don't know. There's a lot of Harley T-shirts out there. <laughs> and what's really cool, and, and, and this is one of the conversations I had early on with, with our guys as, as regards to apparel, is that they, if you put your city's name on the Harley shirt, then everybody wants one. And they've created this need of if you visit a city and you are and you ride a Harley, you want to go get the T-shirt. And CrossFit's one of the only people or one of the only brands I've seen as a community that kind of adopted that really quickly early on. And sure enough, when people go visit a town, they try to find, if they're a CrossFitter, they try to find a CrossFit to go get a shirt. Just well, yeah. show they've been to different gyms. Yeah. So that, that Harley thing really transferred over. And I'm, I'm sure Harley wasn't the first one that did it, but I, I remember when I was growing up being around a lot of people that, that rode Harleys and they really took pride in having a Harley shirt from every city that they visited, even if they got it at the airport. You know, yeah, it's just, a conversation piece. Yeah, for sure. And it's a way to identify yourself for sure. And, um, you know, walking and you, you're in the airport a lot and you can pick out like different groups, especially by the shirts they wear. And oh, yeah, absolutely. You, and I'm sure that you're getting to the point now where you guys see a kill cliff shirt in the airport every now and then. And that's, that's gotta oh, be yeah. cool to see that. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And it's, that's been really big for you and you guys, one of the things I noticed is that you guys just didn't do like a line of clothing that just had the brand on it. Like you really did. You, you guys really kind of stepped into the design and, and, and have some really cool shirts, you know? And I, and I think that's yeah, why it, people it, are buying them. It, Cause if they were just all white kill cliff shirts, I'm not sure everybody would want one like they do now. You guys right. have really done a really good job of design. Absolutely. Well, kittens with lasers. I mean, what more do you need for a t-shirt? <laughs> I've Listen, seen that shirt a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that is the cat with laser thing. That's a valuable lesson for me. I, when that came up, I was like, who came up with this? This is the dumbest thing <laughs> I've ever heard of. Yeah. This is a terrible idea. And it is without a doubt, the most popular thing we've ever done. And it's just silly. Oh yeah. And hey, what's the new one now? The Cobra. Yeah. Cobra Kai. That's oh, I love wow. it. <laughs> The funny thing about that, here's the best part about that. The girl that had that made for us that does our apparel never heard of Karate Kid. Really? So yeah. where does she get the Cobra from? Is that from like Dodgeball? I sent it to her. That was from me. No, oh. I, I was like, we got to make this. And she's like, this shirt's been made before. And I was like, excuse me? She's oh. like, yeah, just Google Cobra Kai on the internet. And I was like, but you're messing with me, right? <laughs> I was like, that, that's a movie. <laughs> That just means you're hiring people that are way younger than you, Baker. And, uh, well, I'm 40, so there's everyone younger than me. But, um, no, that's been, uh, you know, an interesting thing. You know, it's like you, you, no matter how much you know, like you're not always right. And that's what I've learned is that, like, I may think something is terrible, but, you know, my opinion is different than everyone's, you know. And so just because I think it's a bad idea doesn't mean that it is a bad idea. What's well, also – you- you also have people around you that you trust, I'm assuming, because you guys seem to have a really good team. So if somebody has an idea, you know, you you got if you have a solid team, you have to take those things seriously. Absolutely, yeah, and you got to trust people to do what their what their job is, and that was one of the things that Todd did a really good job with is um, allowing people to do their jobs and not like micromanaging them, and um, you know, just meddling in what they're doing, you know, so. You know, we just came out with some new apparel that we released at the Granite Games, which you should be seeing um, all over the place soon. Some, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of some, like the Cobra Kai shirt and some other stuff. So, yeah, it's exciting. You know, it's fun. It's always fun to launch new products, you know, re- regardless of what it is. And, you know, and that's another thing. If I was a gym owner, like, I would do shirts for my gym constantly, you know, if, if for nothing more than just to get people excited and promoting the brand. But it's also, you know, another profit center. People mm-hmm. want that people want to rep their gym shirts. Like they want to do that, you know? So one, and one of the things I was going to have you, I was going to have you, I was going to ask you is if maybe like some things you see that are big misses for a lot of gyms that you visit. And one of the things that, and, and I consult gyms as well. And I always ask them about the pro shop and owners have no idea how much money and even just retention comes from having a really nice pro shop with apparel and the apparel is great for community and marketing. But just having some drinks and some just maybe something to eat, like that. Can, oh, that retail can pay is for, a huge can, component. Yeah, and it can pay for a front desk worker. Like it, it yeah, already, there's a yeah, there's a couple gyms. 
there's a couple gyms that stick out. Like Rockland CrossFit crushes it with retail. They do a phenomenal job. Brick does it well. Brick JP, well. you know, when people, when the games roll around, JP has tons and tons of, of, uh, of drop-ins. And he doesn't charge a drop-in fee. What he does is he says, hey, buy a shirt, and we waive your drop-in fee. And that is one of the best things I've seen yeah. a gym owner do. Um, I know that uh, CJ Martin and Ben Bergeron absolutely kill it on retail because your gym members, they're going to buy this stuff somewhere. Somehow they're going to get it. And that's what I tell gym owners is, you know, Hey, they're going to buy this stuff. They might as you might as well be, you know, um, profiting from it and, and benefiting from it. And what it fo- forces gym owners to do, it forces them to think more like a business person. Yep. Because yeah. it's another profit center within the gym's walls. With okay, the same so amount you, of members, too. Like you're yeah, making exactly. more money with the same amount of members. Right. And what they do is, you know, uh, we just do T-shirts and water. It's like, okay, well, that's fine. But if your gym owner, if your gym members are going out and getting this stuff, you know, directly from the companies, you should be buying it yourself because you'll get it at a better price than them. And there's a profit margin there for you. you and, it, and it's and nice for them to hang out and, and drink and eat stuff that you sell at the gym. Absolutely. It, 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 it creates, you know, the whole social club atmosphere at the gym, which I think is very, very important. You'll, you'll like this. One of the gyms that uh, I, I work with is uh, CrossFit Hickson in Tennessee. Uh-huh. And she has, and she came up with this idea. She has basically order by number, like meals. So she sells a Kill Cliff and a bar as like a number one. And she has like five combos like that. And she's just killing it with it. Cause it's really easy for a member just to come up and be like, all right, I want that. I want the number two. <laughs> and he grabs yeah. like a Kill Cliff and a bar and he's out. And if he didn't get it there, he would go down to the gas station and probably buy something that wasn't as good for him and spend right. just as much, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. it's the, um, you know, it, you know, some people like, they're like, oh, well, you know, we won't, we won't do that much and we won't make a ton of money doing it. You're not trying to get rich, but like doing that, but you know, what it does is it'll help you hire another coach. It'll help you buy more equipment for the gym. Yeah. Um, it will like if I don't care who you are. If I gave you a check for ten dollars, what are you going to do with it? You're going to deposit it in your bank account. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter how much the check's for. It's going to get deposited. You yeah. Know, money for, is money. For most gyms, they can, and I tell them this: you can pay for your front desk worker with your pro shop. And do you absolutely? A front desk worker will get you more members because there's someone there for customer service. And if somebody yeah. walks in when you're coaching, and no one talks to them, they're gone. And that's three thousand dollars that just walked out, you know. So. It's like a curb appeal, you know. People that don't understand the, the CrossFit culture or have never been a part of it or have never been in a CrossFit gym, they walk in, and that's what Glassman talks about is that wow effect, you know, the wow effect. When people walk into the gym, they need to be like, "Holy shit, this is the coolest thing ever!" Yep. That's what you're shooting for because you have to look at what they're used to, and that's the Globo Gym mentality. And they walk into some gr- grungy, grimy, you know, hot box, and that's not what they're looking for. You know, they're looking to get in shape, and a lot of them you have to convince. And if they can walk in and they see a degree of professionalism and it looks like, an, you know, a legit business, you know, that's, that's the big thing. Another thing that I see a lot of, um, not a lot, but Jim's doing is when they focus on the competitive aspect of CrossFit and they get away from the health and wellness component. You know, yeah. like what they're, they focus on their athletes or fire breathers or whatever, and they neglect the rest of the gym members. Yeah. And I've seen, I've seen, especially in the last two or three years, that has been really detrimental to a lot of communities. Yeah. Like they, you know, your fire breathers, you know, most of them aren't paying for their membership, you know, because the gym owner gives it for free and they get to coach a couple classes and like having a guy that goes and wins all the local throwdowns, that's not going to bring you new members to your gym. Yeah. It's not. It actually scares yeah. scare off a lot of a lot of the normal people. <laughs> Absolutely it does. It does it runs people off, you know? Yeah. And I've seen it firsthand in hand in numerous gyms. Yeah. That's interesting cuz that that's I I hear that as a topic more and more kind of in the gyms that are successful and the gyms that aren't as successful don't seem to like understand that yet. 
but it's almost right. it's almost a sign of uh, business kind of Im- immaturity that they don't oh, really yeah. get that part of it yet. But yeah, well, there's a lot of people that you know that that think okay, well, that, so they're a member of like a, a local gym, and they're one of the better athletes in the gym, and they want to start their own affiliate because they're like, oh, well, you know, I'll get a hundred members, and they'll pay me. 150 bucks a month. So it's $15,000 a month I'll make. <laughs> With no overhead. No brainer. With why, no yeah, overhead. why don't I just do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, running a CrossFit gym, man, it, it takes a ton of work, and most people don't understand yeah. that. And so, you know, you have a gym with, let's say you got a, a great gym in, 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 a, in this one town, and there's 300 members there. And then two of the coaches leave because they think they can do it better. And what they do is they take members from that gym. So instead of having one great gym, you now have a good gym, an okay gym, and one gym that's struggling to get by. Yeah. And, you know, that's people need to have business plans. And I think that it's important that gym owners have meetings with their coaches and they keep everyone informed and they run it like a business because that is what it is. It is a business. Well, we always talk about in our staff meetings, it's, it's if we're not successful as a business, then we won't get to help anyone. So right. if you really want to help a lot of people, then you have to do the right things on the back end so that you can pay coaches a good wage. Yeah, so it's the little things. Those are yeah, the little things are your budget busters. Yeah. Like, that's what will that's what'll sink you. It's the little things. It's not the big things, it's the little tiny things. Yeah. Is it, so how can gym owners use uh, tools like Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram to really listen to their members and understand what they're feeling about the gym? So that's basically what Glassman said was your, the greatest tool that you have is your members. And I'll take it a step further. So not only do you have your members, you have your members' social media. And that ties into the gym check-in. That, that's, you got to do that. And then you have, like, you know, promote things on, on the weekends where your members can bring in their friends to the gym. And you just, you know, you keep it interesting, you keep it entertaining, and you keep it active, you know. Post the workout the, the, day bef- the night before. People will be on there talking about it, what, you know, commenting and whatnot. That's important. Instagram, like I said, promote your members throughout the day. And if, if, if Bobby Sue, who follows you, who lives in, in, in Iowa, and your gym's in Massachusetts, he thinks you post too much, screw him. It doesn't matter what he thinks. Yep. It's all about your community and it's all about your members. Oh. That's the only thing that matters. I've had that conversation so many times. <laughs> what if, yeah. what if uh, somebody doesn't want to see my members checking in? I'm like, that guy will never that guy will never come in and be a member like who cares? Like right, you, exactly. All their important. friends that love them and and are rooting for their their journey, like that's who you want anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. So that's like the old, uh, the unsubscribe, like you don't want anybody to unsubscribe when you hear a lot of those guys, like I want people to unsubscribe because it cleans my list up. Yeah. So if, if they don't, yeah, that's the only thing that matters is what happens in, in the, inside the walls of your gym. And a lot of, I see some gyms like focusing on what other gyms in town are doing or, yeah, you know, bad. that's just negativity. Yep. You know, you don't ever want to be a crab in a bucket. So you ever seen a bucket with crabs in it and you got one crab that's trying to get out and the other crabs are just reaching up and grabbing on to whatever they can. And you don't ever want to be a barrier to someone else's success or just because yeah. cons- it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't accomplish anything. Like, you know, like you see, like, the one good thing about uh, my favorite thing about CrossFit, there's not a lot of shit bags in it because crappy people don't like hard work. Yeah. And the barrier to entry to CrossFit is hard work. The better you get at CrossFit, the harder it gets because you got to work harder. And there's not a ton of haters. There's, there's haters just by nature in certain parts of the country, you know, because that's just how they are in that part of the country. But like, don't ever let like beef get started between you know a, a neighboring gym and the gym that you're in and stuff like that. And like, who cares what they say? Yeah, that's it's not just really taking your eye off the what's really the goal here. <laughs> You know, Absolutely. Is, is it to tear yeah, somebody yeah. else down or is it to build your gym up? Yeah. Cause what's good for your gym is good for the next gym. And what's good for the next gym is good for your gym. Yeah. Well, Baker, we're almost out of time, but do you have any parting rants you'd like to share with gym owners out there? Mm, 
No, no ranch today. <laughs> I bet a few Word, tips in. Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. We had we've had a few. Normally, I have th- tons and tons of this stuff, but I, you know. Um, let me let me ask you this: If so, you've you've been to hundreds of gyms. Let's let's. What's like one thing that really stuck out as a positive thing in a gym that you visited, maybe in the last year or so? Like some like something they did that kind of blew you away. Um, let's see. What gym has blown me away? Dramatic pause. I got to I I just have to say the way that CJ runs the Invictus community. I really do like if you look at the way that CJ Martin runs CrossFit Invictus, um, it's never about him, you know, or, or his, he, he makes it about his community and his athletes. Yeah. And I think that's, what's really important. Like his gym has tons and tons of superstar athletes in it, but his, the gym promotes the gym and the sea of green and Invictus. Like it, that's what it's all about. Like last year, at the California Regional, um, Catherine Blattner had a really bad knee injury, like really bad tendonitis, and they were sitting in seventh. And CJ was more concerned about the team getting to the games than any individual athlete competing. It was just, it's all he cared about. He said this, he said, it, it means more to me than anything else. Is 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 the is the affiliate making it to the games? Because that's what he that's the only thing he really that's what he cares about more than anything. Because without that, he has nothing. You know. Yeah. Yep. Makes and sense. I, and let me say this: with like affiliates that want to throw these comps and all that stuff, and these throwdowns, and they want an event like the ECC or the Granite Games, like everyone needs to take a step back and like really take a look at how much work goes into comps oh. and throwing a successful comp. I don't want anything and, to do with it. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's probably my one thing that I would, I would throw out there that I think is really important that people understand is like saying you want to have an event like the Granite Games or the ECC is one thing and wanting to have one of those events, that's one thing. But actually pulling that stuff off it takes, it takes an entire year and it takes a team. Like you're not gonna, I mean, you can have a cool logo and design a cool website, but at the end of the day, like you gotta have judges and equipment and workouts and all this stuff. And like people try to reinvent the wheel with creativity for these workouts, as opposed to just, you know, doing CrossFit. Like that's the one thing, like just do CrossFit. That's what you, you want to be successful, do CrossFit because anything that you do outside of that is really going to be a distraction from what the ultimate goal is, and that's your affiliate. Yeah, that's great advice. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today, Baker. Baker, you rock, yeah, man. man. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, it guys. Yep. Have a great day. All right, take All right, care. See you, man. Later. Thanks for listening today. The Gym Owner's Guide to the Galaxy was produced by Matt Sharp, Jeremy Russell, and me, John Bouchon. We're publishing new episodes every two weeks, so make sure you don't miss a single one. Just search for Sweat Angels or The Gym Owner's Guide to the Galaxy on iTunes or SoundCloud. We are a production of Sweat Angels, the number one referral program for gym owners. Sweat Angels helps drive new members at your gym by combining Facebook check-ins with giving back. If you haven't heard of us, just go to causely.com forward slash sweat angels or search for us on Facebook. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on the Gym Owner's Guide to the Galaxy. Sounds weird. Does it? Yeah. And oh. I'm Matt Sharp. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs>